Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to the Mahoney Hall for our next session. Um, when we decided to host and to run the World Anti-Bullying Forum here at DCU, it was very important for us to involve UNESCO as our partner with Friends and International Bullying Prevention Association. Um, as you may know, UNESCO um, hosts our sponsors a chair, the chair on tackling bullying in schools and cyberspace here at DCU. So it was really, we were very excited when UNESCO came on board and agreed to be an organising partner um, for the forum. So I'm delighted to welcome from UNESCO today uh, Mr Chris Castles, the Head of Section, and Mr uh, Christophe Cornu, the Head of Project, um, uh, who both work in this field all the time in tackling bullying, and we'll be hearing from them throughout the, the next few days. There are three sessions that are sponsored by UNESCO, um, specifically, apart from being a, a, an, or, an organising partner. This session today is on the, what is the role for schools in preventing and addressing cyberbullying. And um, I'll be handing over to Chris in a moment to run that session. And then um, we have later on today at two o'clock, we will have again here in the Matney Hall, um, Christophe Cornu will present the findings from UNESCO's new report, the global report on the nature scope drivers and consequences of bullying. It's a really important report for UNESCO and for us, so we look forward to hearing about the findings of that report at 2 o'clock today in this room. And then on Thursday at 8.15 uh, in the morning, uh, we'll have a session, again a thematic session sponsored by UNESCO, and it's called Approaches to Addressing Bullying Related to Migration findings from a literature review, and that's involving some of our colleagues from, from Norway and elsewhere. So we have three really important sessions uh, sponsored by UNESCO, who are an organizing partner for this forum, and I I'm, I'm encourage you to come to all of those three sessions. So without further ado, I hand over now to Chris, who's going to be the chair for, for this session. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Good morning, my name is Chris Castle. I'm the Chief of the Section for Health and Education at UNESCO. It's a great pleasure for us to be uh, an organizing partner with Dublin City University. And as James mentioned, um, we have a UNESCO chair newly established to look specifically at the issues around online safety and cyberbullying. Um, for this particular session this morning, um, we have assembled a fantastic panel. I'm delighted that so many of you came. Thank you very much. Um, and we're going to be exploring, really in particular, the role of schools and the education sector in all of this. Uh, just a couple of quick words about UNESCO's um, engagement. Um, I'm in the education sector, as is my colleague Christoph Cornu. It's the E in UNESCO for education. Um, and for us, one of the very important things in the United Nations, of course, is the Sustainable Development Goals, all 17 of those goals, and then, of course, particularly goal number four, relating to the importance of a good quality education for all learners. Um, and within that, UNESCO sees that the issues around um, school safety um, and a positive school learning environment is incredibly important to support good learning outcomes. And that for us is really the justification and the reason why we consider school violence and bullying such a very important and critical topic. We're delighted that this international forum um, for as a spotlight on how important it is and how we're really overcoming, I think, decades of uh, attitudes and views in the community about school violence and bullying um, that didn't really take it very seriously. And I think now with the increasing amount of research that's emerging and some of which we'll be hearing in the panel, it's better understood that all learners um, you know, should have a right to education free from violence and bullying. And really the, the incredible uh, negative impacts of bullying and cyberbullying on learning outcomes um, that I think we're, we're growing much, much more aware of and understanding. I wanted just to mention a couple of additional things. One is um, UNESCO is a proud partner of the Power of Zero campaign, and you're going to hear a little bit more about that. It focuses on starting to reach very young-aged learners, and our colleague from Singapore today on the panel, Anita Lo Lim, will talk a little bit more about that. Um, and I believe we have Nicholas Carlyle here, who's the um, president of No Bully, who is the um, secretariat for the Power of Zero campaign, and so hopefully you'll have an opportunity to learn a bit more about that important initiative throughout the forum. UNESCO is also very engaged in the Safe to Learn campaign, which is uh, the secretariat of that is based at UNICEF in the End Violence campaign, and it's this particular focus on safe learning environments. And so obviously you can see why we felt it was very important to be a core partner for that particular initiative as well. Um, 
people often think cyberbullying raises issues or questions around, well, okay, but how does, what's the role of the school in terms of responding um, to cyberbullying? Because it's, it's so much more than the school and it happens outside of school hours. And I think um, our th this is something that UNESCO, for example, regularly hears from ministers of education and colleagues in the education sector. What should we be doing about this? What is our role? I'm sure many of you here in the audience will, will already know that schools have a critical role to play uh, with regards to this, and that's really our purpose with the panel today is to explore specifically how schools can contribute to preventing and addressing online or uh, cyberbullying. Um, and the connections between online and offline school violence and bullying. Um, so now I'm going to, basically just to give you a heads up for the way we've organized this session, we will be um, having three initial presentations, then we'll open up for a brief amount of Q&A. You can all also jump in and ask questions. Then we'll have two final presentations focusing more on some of the practical good practice and case studies from different countries. Um, and then we'll open up again to more questions. We have 90 minutes for this session, and we hope um, that we'll have a, a lively and engaged, relaxed and informal exchange and conversation, both with our panelists and with you. Um, so hopefully we'll have a maximum amount of time for you to engage and participate in that. For the first um, presentation, we have Dr. Mairead Foody, who's a research fellow here at the ABC Center at DCU. It's uh, the anti-bullying uh, uh, research and uh, clearinghouse, I guess, ABC. You'll probably clarify that better than me, but it's the ABC Center who's one of the organizers as well for the forum. Um, and she will now take over and present. Thank you very much, Mairead. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, so as Chris said, my name is Mairead. I work as a research fellow at the Anti-Bullying Research Centre at Dublin uh, City University, but I also am lucky to be on secondment at the moment um, at Friends, who are a partner in organising this event, and they're based in Stockholm. So what I'm going to try to do today in about 10 minutes or so is to talk very briefly um, in, about cyberbullying and how we understand cyberbullying as researchers, and then maybe to try to pose some questions that come up out of the research that we've conducted. Um, and these questions are kind of giving us some suggestion or some direction of, of what we should be doing when we look to interventions. And Robert is then going to talk about the interventions, or maybe the components that are good for interventions um, in terms of reducing cyberbullying. So to start off with, um, I'm going to just briefly mention what we mean by cyberbullying in terms of a definition. So, the, the literature, the kind of cyberbullying literature has evolved from, well, in some cases, from traditional bullying literature, which means that when we look to definitions, we're looking to the same elements that we might have considered in traditional bullying or face-to-face -face bullying. Um, so for something to be face-to-face -face or offline or traditional bullying, it needs to have specific components. Um, and those are things like intentionality, it needs, the behavior needs to be repetitive, there needs to be an imbalance of power, and obviously negative outcomes. And we would say that for cyberbullying, or something to be defined as cyberbullying, it should also contain all of these elements, but maybe be happening in the online space or the electronic world. Um, and just to give a good example of a definition of cyberbullying, even though there are many out there in the literature, um, I'll just kind of quote Professor Smith from uh, Goldsmith University, who says that cyberbullying is an aggressive, intentional act carried out by a group or individual using mobile phones or the internet repeatedly and over time against a victim who cannot easily defend him or herself. So if we look at it in that sense, um, there are some differences between bullying in the offline world and bullying in the online world. So obviously things like power imbalance might actually be not because of strength or because of popularity, but because of technical expertise, for example. There's also quite a big difference in terms of the anonymity of the perpetrator, um, which means that they they are not, you know, the person who's been victimized cannot see the person who's bullying them. And also the opposite, in that the person who is bullying or trying to hurt somebody can't actually see the reaction of their victim. Um, another big difference between offline bullying and online bullying um, is the, the kind of the quite complex roles of bystanders. So in the online world, we have a bigger audience and we have many, many more people who can witness um, and see bullying and maybe intervene in different ways or sometimes in negative ways and actually engage in bullying without even realizing if they've passed on something, for example, like an image and shared something um, that was originally posted to hurt somebody. So with that also, it's important to notice that the there's a quite a big difference when we talk about repetition. 
Um, repetition is quite obvious in our, in our offline world or in school bullying. We can see it if somebody is targeted repeatedly over and over again. We can say that's bullying. In the online world, it's a little bit more complex. And something as, as simple as sharing one image once that then has been viewed by many people um, or passed on by many people can be the, the, repeti the repetition part. And it makes it a little bit more difficult to say that this is definitely bullying. If somebody has only done it once, is it more likely to be aggression um, or harassment, for example? So if we assume that we have a definition and then we want to look at prevalence, um, the research, again, is, is actually a little bit vague. So international prevalence rates go from about 4 to 54% when we look at cyberbullying, which doesn't really tell us anything. You know, it doesn't say how many people are actually cyberbullied if we have a range that's quite so, quite so large. Um, and I guess some of the different, or the reasons why we have such a large prevalence rate is also what, how we consider cyberbullying, what definition we use, um, the time frame that we ask about, if it's, have you ever been cyberbullied, we're going to get bigger rates compared to if you've asked somebody have they been cyberbullied in school, in this school term. Um, also, how we code frequency and this idea of repetition can confuse things sometimes. So again, prevalence, even though we try to do it, can be quite a cagey area of research because it isn't always um, exact. What we did do in Ireland um, in one of our own studies was we conducted a meta-analysis of all of the studies that were produced in Ireland for the past 10 to 15 years. And we found a rate of about, in using meta-analysis software, 9.6, or 1 in 10 individuals in Ireland, and their post-primary students, so 12 to 18-year-olds, had been cyber-victimized in that school term. And that was pulling all of the available research together. So that's kind of the figure that we're working off in the Irish context. OK, so then we have to think about methods. So what exactly is cyberbullying? And this is the part that gets, I think, quite confusing, and, and actually the part that will give us more questions than answers. So for me, the problem with trying to say, well, this is cyberbullying or this is not cyberbullying, um, well, there's three main difficulties. The first one is that we have other language we might use, which I've talked, just mentioned, for example, we might say something is cyber violence or cyber harassment, um, and we use these sometimes interchangeably with cyberbullying. So that can be hard to say, well, something is exactly cyberbullying or something isn't. The other really complex part is that when we look at cyberbullying, we actually can't just look at it as if it's completely separate to a child's offline life. So, for example, for, any, for many cyberbullying incidences, they can happen or start in the school environment, um, in the playground, in their classroom, in their sports club, and then they can sometimes filter online. So we can't actually say, well, this is only cyberbullying, because it's very complicated. And the relationship between the two um, has been well established, that sometimes incidents will, will, will go between cyber and offline worlds. And then the other problem is actually that, in a sense, when you speak to young people, you realize that even saying something is cyberbullying or something is online versus offline is a little bit futile. Because for many young people today, they live all of their lives online. They have school online, they have um, their friends, the games that they play, their social life, and even their support networks. So for us as adults to say, what's it like when you're online, and making that differentiation with the online and the offline world is a little bit alien to them, because lots of young people don't really do that anymore. So they might say, yeah, the internet is a great place, and there's a part of it that can be a bit annoying sometimes for me, where I may be victimized, or something bad has happened. But what we tend to do then with adults is say, well, all of the internet it can be risky or all of it can be bad. And sometimes our interventions go that way, where we just try to maybe take away phones, take away devices as a way to solve the problem. So with that in mind, I just thought just to highlight um, this bit of a divide as, as well as using some, to document some of the research that we're doing. Um, I just wanted to talk about some of the studies that we've done in Ireland to kind of look at this and, and look at what cyberbullying means to young people. Um, we had one large-scale study where we, we asked all, about 2,000 young people um, about their different kind of um, experiences online or negative experiences. And in that study, we realized that the biggest or the most problematic um, cases were for young people were when pictures had been shared of them, typically without their consent. Um, so then we started to think, okay, so first of all, why are young people sharing these images? Um, and we started with just some simple questions with a pilot study of young people where we asked them about their uh, tendency or their needs or their wants to share images, and not just images, but also, but in particular, sexual images. 
So we started with a pilot study of about 1,000 young people in Ireland, and we asked them about you know, their tendency, or if they, they were asked to send a sexual image, and, and if they did do it, um, or if they asked other people to do it, to send them. And we found that, and which isn't too much of a concern for me as a bullying researcher, we found that about 24% of 15 to 18-year-olds in Ireland will choose to send a sexual image of themselves to somebody. Mostly they're sending it to people in their own class, or their own age, or people that they're in a relationship with. And that's not bullying. That's in no sense a scary factor. If you consider but, you know, the fact that people are living, or young people are living most of their lives online, and emotional relationships will start to develop, particularly around the ages of 15 to 18 years. But what became a bit scary was when we asked them, has anyone ever shared a sexual image of you online without your consent? And we would argue that this is actually what becomes cyberbullying. If you start off with something that's quite normal, um, well, maybe I won't say normal, but something that isn't that scary or isn't victimization, and, they, and people are sharing images by choice, but that then image has been taken and shared on by somebody else without their consent, we would say that this is then cyberbullying. And the answer was that for our sample of 15 to 18-year-olds, 13% said this had happened them once or more. And actually, this wasn't the scary finding. What was quite scary was the next question, when we said, OK, well, who did you tell about this? And what we found was about 50% of our sample of young people said that they wouldn't tell anybody. About 47% said that they might tell a friend or someone their own age. 3% said that they would tell a parent. And then the other minor 2% or so said that they would speak to, or not speak to, but um, report to the website or the app operator. So this actually highlights, I think, for us at the Anti-Bullying Centre, the direction that we wanted to go in our research, because we realised that if we continue to think about cyberbullying as uh, maybe this separate issue to our lives, or our, our, our young person's total life, and we also do it in a, in a way where we assume we know what we're talking about without speaking to young people. We have interventions that are driven from, from very different points. Um, and so if we think about what schools need to do, I think the biggest point is that we need to start listening to young people, if we haven't already. We need to understand that they have a voice and they will tell us what's scary about the internet or what they need help with. And we also maybe need to stop thinking about the internet as, as uh, something that we need to stop or prohibit. Um, and open, have an open dialogue with our young people to see what it is that they need in terms of interventions um, and support networks to help them use the internet in a safe way and hopefully reduce cyberbullying. So with that, that's basically it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mairead, for that. Um, excellent presentation. I think it really helps us to have that sort of definitional overview and explain some of the complexities of uh, what's, uh, what makes up cyberbullying and how we have to think about it and approach it. So thanks very much for that very clear and helpful presentation, as well as the, the data that you've shared from the, um, the prevalence in, in Ireland that you, you shared with us as well. Some of it quite sobering. Um, for the next presentation, we have Dr. Robert Slanger, who's also with the Anti-Bullying Center here at DCU. Um, Robert has a multi-decade background of uh, practical and research uh, work in this particular area, and we're looking forward to him sharing a bit more on international perspectives, um, particularly relating to interventions and the whole school approach. Robert. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. So I'm going to be giving a brief overview of international perspectives on cyberbullying. Sorry, I need this one. On uh, international perspectives on cyberbullying preventions and interventions. Now, as Mairead mentioned, our kids don't seem to differentiate between the online and offline world to the same extent as we adults do. And in fact, many successful anti-bullying programs in school incorporate cyberbullying within other forms of offline bullying as well. And one of the most successful international approaches and that forms the basis of most successful anti-bullying programs is the whole school approach. Now, very simplified, the whole school approach involves gathering the students and the wider network together 
to understand what the problem is and try to solve it together. So we have a look at a few key players and a few key points within that approach. The students. It's important to try to include the students' voice when we form our anti-bullying policies at schools. And that has to do that if students are involved in forming the policies, they're much more likely to follow them compared to if they're just told what to do. Now, to be able to have that voice, we as adults need to educate and talk to our students about what cyberbullying is actually. So what is it? What kind of consequences it might have? How to spot it? How to try to prevent it? And if it does happen, where to go to report it? Within the context as well is that a school should have clear student support services. Another issue that's come up that might be beneficial is to try to enhance our students' empathy. Now, empathy can be seen in two different ways, a cognitive way and an effective way. So in a cognitive way is knowing what one's action, one, well, knowing what kind of consequences one's actions might have towards someone else. In an effective way is to try to put yourself in someone's shoes and try to understand how you would feel if the same behavior were directed towards you. When we talk about the students, it's important to talk about online safety as well. And when we discuss online safety, we talk about it in general terms. So just as we would teach our kids on how to be safe on the streets, we need to teach our kids on how to be safe online. Now, general online safety has shown to be beneficial within the cyberbullying context as well. And if we have a look at three key players within the bullying context, and if we start with the victims there, so it's not to put themselves at unnecessary risk. And that is not to try to put any kind of blame on the victims and saying that you are being bullied because you're doing something wrong. It really has to do with general concepts, just as we would teach our kids not to leave a bag in a public space because it might get stolen. Don't put a picture in a public space online because it might get stolen. When it comes to the bystanders, again, an online safety module might uh, teach them on how to spot whether a friend or someone they know is at risk and might be able to help them before it escalates to something else. And lastly, with the bullies. Now, I think that many kids, without thinking, sometimes send off a picture to a friend without thinking too much about it. That friend does the same and suddenly it escalates out of control. Now, online safety modules might teach our kid what kind of consequences their actions might have. So that's the student. Another key player within the whole school approach is the school staff. Now, when we speak about the school staff, we talk about all school staff. The people driving the school bus, the teachers, the people working in the canteen, leadership, management, all school staff. Now, research has shown that all school staff should be trained in what cyberbullying is, which kind of negative consequences it has, how to spot it, how to prevent it, and also how to intervene. It's also been shown to be beneficial that school staff have some basic internet knowledge. And when we talk about basic internet knowledge, it really is very basic, about setting passwords, how to set privacy settings, knowing just a little bit about the social media that your students are on. Now, what we would like the school staff to become experts in is how to deal with the cyberbullying behavior. However, if we want to become experts in dealing with the cyberbullying behavior, we need to have some really basic internet knowledge. Another thing that's worth mentioning within the school staff setting has to do with school management or school leadership. It's important that the leadership within a school commits to an anti-bullying school uh, anti-bullying program at school. And commitment doesn't come just in terms of energy. It comes in terms of their own time, in terms of their employees' time, and mainly in terms of a student's time. Because research has shown that if we embed an anti-bullying program within the curriculum of that school, so it happens on a continuous basis, it's much more effective compared to if we just do a one-off intervention. The school climate. Again, we're speaking about the school climate as a whole. The literature has shown that uh, schools that promote diversity and promote positive relationship 
overall has lower rates of bullying. And those positive relationship is not just between the students and students, but also between the students and staff, and also how staff and staff treat each other. Now, the home environment, the parents and the guardians, again, just as with the school staff, they need to know what cyberbullying is. They need to know what consequences it might have. They need to be able to spot it, whether the child is involved. Uh, they need to know how to prevent it and intervene. And again, it's important that the home environment also has some basic uh, internet knowledge. And this goes hand in hand, but research has shown that some kind of internet supervision is beneficial. And when we speak about internet supervision, it's not saying that the parents should sit over their children's shoulder looking exactly what they're doing online. It's more having a general discussion with your kids. Just as you might ask them after being out a whole day what they were doing outside, who they met, if they met a new friend, you might have wanted to invite them over to meet them. The same goes for the online world. Just have an open uh, discussion with them, what they're doing online, who they're meeting, maybe even ask if you can befriend them on Facebook, etc. The wider network. Now, the wider network tended historically to be the after-school activities such as the uh, football coach, the swimming teachers, so basically significant adults within the child's life who spend some time with that student. So it was important for them as well to know what cyberbullying was and how to prevent it. However, within the cyberbullying context, a new key player has entered the field, and that is the tech companies. And these are the companies that actually provide the platforms that our youth are engaging on. So what's really amazing with this forum is that we have representatives from these tech companies, we have representatives from the research community, we have representatives from the home environment, from the school and from the wider network. So during these three days, we can all listen to each other, learn from each other and talk to each other. Because why this, school, uh, why this approach has seemed to work in the past and still kind of holds its ground is that if everyone working with and for kids understand the problem and work towards a common goal, it seems to be much more beneficial compared to individual scattered attempts without any kind of direction. Yes. I don't have an end slide, sorry. I forgot to put my email there. Please ask me afterwards. <laughs> Thank you very much, Robert. Um, that was, I think, an excellent presentation. And I think probably many of us have heard about the whole school approach, but it was wonderful to have your clear um, overview and explanation. It's, uh, it's uh, certainly backed up by all the research that we're familiar with. And how to actually achieve the whole school approach in practice is, is something that we all need to think a lot more about. So thank you very much for that excellent presentation. Uh, as Robert mentioned, at, at this forum, we're, we're delighted to have industry representatives um, present as well, and that's a really important part of the overall picture. And in our panel, we're delighted to have Kieran Conlon, who is the Director of Public Policy from Microsoft Ireland, who will make our next presentation. Kieran, over to you. Make sure I get these in the right order. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I'm probably the least informed member of the panel today. Um, so I'll hold my hands up on that basis. Uh, I joined Microsoft in November. Uh, before that, I spent the majority of my career working in Irish politics, both in opposition and in government as an advisor to Richard Bruton. Um, just as a general comment about this gathering, one of the things that I've seen when working in an Irish political environment and trying to affect public policy change or to move the needle is that whatever chance you have of making a positive change by getting the political system, enterprise or industry, and civic society together at events like this, whatever chance you have of making an impact, in the absence of that, you've got almost no chance of making an impact. So this event is just a wonderful example of that collaboration. 
I want to just cover three things uh, with my presentation. Uh, just tell you a little bit about Microsoft's approach to online safety and where we feel we're we can make a contribution. To tell you about our Digital Civility Index, which is a three-year-long annualized uh, research uh, uh, piece of research in over 20 countries globally. And then tell you a little bit about the Irish numbers as well. Um, when we get to the slides, don't be worried about the number of them. I've clearly won the most slides prize, but most of them are just going to be for reference. I said I'd include them so that uh, they'd be in your delegate packs if you wanted more information. So Microsoft's approach to online safety, uh, it's the four C's, content, contact, conduct, and commerce. We want to maximize the positive experiences online and do everything we can to minimize uh, the negative. And they're the four, four C's that we work through. Uh, so illegal content, extreme, extreme or hateful content, unwanted contact, uh, bullying, online reputation. I was just talking to uh, uh, Janice just before. Uh, one of the programs that I'm involved in with Microsoft at the moment is funding a new master's in digital policy studies. Um, in, uh, I can say the, the name U UCD, the right, right letters, but the wrong combination. Um, one of the things we've observed is that most public policy people in government tend to be generalists. So as difficult as it might be for industry to try and keep track with the challenges of the, the rapid pace of change, people within government really have a tough time for, to get legislation to keep track. And so we're introducing this master's to try and build up that capability within the Irish system. But we had a workshop last week and we had uh, a senior counsel, uh, uh, a lady, I won't mention her name, uh, speaking about taking cases uh, regarding online abuse or um, bullying or uh, things of that nature. And we do focus a lot on uh, uh, children, younger people, but this lady told the story about a widower, a man living in the west of Ireland, who got into a very difficult situation in an online dating situation with a partner that ended up taking video footage, sharing it with his, his, uh, uh, with his employers, and he was dismissed by a public sector agency. He was told by a lawyer that he had a slam dunk case of wrongful dismissal, but because of his mortification in a rural Irish community, he refused to go to court because it would be made public. And so there are instances where you talk about, and I'll be showing a lot of numbers uh, and flicking through them quickly, but there are personal stories behind them all, and that's just one of the things that we work so hard at. Uh, Microsoft's approach, obviously we've tried, our business model is really built around trust. Uh, with our clients, with our stakeholders, with government. So we, th th this area is absolutely core to what Microsoft's business is about, but if we don't have trust online, uh, everything becomes much more difficult. Uh, I've mentioned the partnerships, um, our technology and innovation. Uh, one of the awareness raising and education stories that I might touch on again is, out in our Leopardstown headquarters, we've got a facility called DreamSpace where we try to bring in primary and secondary school kids uh, to learn about coding and programming and AI and just a little bit to get them enthused about STEM generally. And we anticipate having 100,000 kids through the facility over four years. We're at about 16,000 since we opened last, uh, last summer. But every kid that takes part in that program gets online safety training as well as part of that program. So it's just a, a way that we see that if we're going to be engaging with kids in their schools, we're bringing it on, on a roadshow as well, that this is integral to what we're doing as well. Digital Civility Index, again, just short summary. It's three years old, 16, 17, and 18. 500 uh, people surveyed in each country, 22 countries in 2018, um, looking at different times, types of harmful behavior or risk behaviors online. It builds on a program of work that was started in 2010, but the Digital Civility Index is three years old. Uh, just in terms of the scoring, it's like golf for any golfers in the room. Uh, it's zero to 100. The lower the number, the better. The higher, the, the greater the risk factors are. 
At the moment, the 2018 index went down globally by two points from 68 to 66, which is an aggregated measure of all those surveys uh, and how people respond. I'll tell you a little bit more about Ireland, but Ireland actually went up last year, which is a source of a little bit of concern. This is the online risk types that we're looking at, behavioral risks, unwanted contacts, sexual risks, um, and hoaxes and scams. So they're the sort of broad buckets in which the questions tend to be asked in. Good news, as I said, the global index fell. Um, the main driver of it dropping in the last uh, 12 months is a significant drop in unwanted contact online. So that was prevalent across nearly all of the geographies. So the 22 countries were in Europe, Asia, Africa, North and South America. Um, so this was a consistent pattern across the globe. The bad news is that the people that are experiencing those risk factors um, are experiencing more consequences uh, they're more stressed, they're losing trust in other people online, they're not sleeping as well, and the actual positive behaviors are also dropping as well. So there's, there, there's sort of a curate's egg, I would say, attitude. I'll just jump through some of these. Uh, again, this is just more for, for later if you want. If you just see in terms of the, the, the risk sources, friends and family have jumped as as a source of risk in terms of bullying type behavior. So that's just sort of shown there by friends and acquaintances. That number has jumped uh, for friends and family. And that's uh, across uh, geographies as well. Uh, this thing really jumped out at me. And I thought about our, our, our friend in the west of Ireland, you know, in terms of the, the, the risk. So 86% of people who've experienced some of the risks that are quizzed in, in, in this index say they experience some form of risk. Now, fully 55% say that they experience moderate or severe uh, pain. So this is, this is getting to some of the humanity as well, and I'll, I'll tell you a story about one of the comments at the workshop about our online humanity. Uh, but the thing that jumped out at me, again, I just underlined it because it really struck me, 8% of the people said that their pain was unbearable. So I guess that's, they're the stories and they're the people that we're in the room for today, but that's a lot of people that are going through a lot of pain because they're struggling uh, with online challenges and risks and how to cope with it. Again, just I'd look over at the box on the right-hand side. These were the consequences I talked to you about. This is, again, human behaviors that are changing all up in terms of consequences. Less trusting of other people online, less trusting offline. My life became more stressful. We're plenty of stress to start with. Lost sleep. But then, on, as well, positive actions. You know, these are the types of behaviors that Microsoft would, would encourage, certainly cor corporately and internally for ourselves. You know, <laughs> And these are the things, the things that you would do offline in the real world rather than online, you know, pausing before replying with somebody you disagreed with. That's so much easier to, to ignore online. So again, they're just some of the, I would say, worrying patterns or, or when you delve into the numbers. Delving a little bit deeper uh, into the numbers uh, probably won't be a surprise, but if you look at the second uh, bar in each of these, it's millennials that have greater number of risks, uh, experience greater consequences, and experience more pain. Delving a little deeper again, again, the right-hand column uh, in all these, uh, girls uh, within the group as well are, have experienced a similar pattern. So probably not, you know, breaking news, but just confirming the types of uh, uh, data that are coming back. I'll just speak for a few minutes about Ireland, and again, there's a few tables here. You can take them and look at them again. So the, the group, it, you see the groupings. Ireland were smack bang in the middle, 11th out of uh, 22. You see the, the global index, 65, 68, and back down again. Ireland has gone 64 to 68. So um, top line, the, the remaining bullets, again, you can have a look at, but the top 
top bullet. M most of the rest of the, the, the patterns, you know, Ireland is broadly consistent with the rest of, uh, of the, the geographies involved. But the, the sort of standout for Ireland in terms of differences, more offensive behavior, obscene content, being called obscene names, and encountering fake news. Uh, so they're the things that sort of spiked in an Irish context when you compared the global with, with the local. Again, that's just summarizing some of these. If you look at these tables down the right-hand side, uh, where is it? Uh, yeah, some, someone called me offensive names. 66 Ireland versus 51 global. You know, some tried to embarrass me on purpose. These are significant, statistically significant differentials between global and, uh, and, and national. So we, we seem to have quite a capacity to be offensive online. Um, that's just confirming the, a bit more detail on the so, immediate social circle is, is an increased source of risk. That's friends and family. Just again, in an Irish context, severe pain was a bit lower in Ireland than globally. Um, and again, this is just taking positive actions. Again, it's a worrying pattern at a certain level, just confirming the drops in taking positive actions uh, in response to, to risks. And again, higher than uh, the global figures on, on some of those consequences experienced. That's just confirming the millennials and a little bit more detail on the girls. Um, I thought I'd try and finish on a positive uh, in terms of the slide, in terms of worldwide there was a big pickup. If you look at the 2016 figure, there's almost negligible numbers of teens uh, looking for help from a parent or a teacher. That picked up in uh, 17 and then 18. In an Irish context, were you know 80, what's that, 80, 78 percent of teenagers are now actively looking to speak to a parent or a teacher to get help or to get advice. In an Irish context, we're well ahead of the global average uh, for that. So that is something that I think is encouraging in an Irish context, and something that we'd certainly hope to build on. I just finished with the comment. Um, Again, just back to that workshop where that same person that told that story about that gentleman in the west of Ireland, she started her remarks at this workshop by saying, and again, this is not my, I'm an economist by training, I've worked in politics for years, this is not my, my core issue, if you like, or core policy area, but she made a comment that really struck me where she talked about how our online, our human rights, that we've worked so hard to fight for and define and secure are progressively being eroded in an online world. And she poses the question, what is our humanity in an online context? What is it to be human in an online context? And that just really drove home the point for me about what is our uh, online humanity. So, that's the concluding slide with all the relevant contact points. So thank you very much for your time, and I hope you got something out of that. Thank you very much for that presentation, Kieran. It's great to see this, um, this data that's both um, sex and age disaggregated, and also to be able to look at trends. I think that's very interesting and very useful for us. So thank you very much for that presentation. And, um, Kieran has a colleague that we've worked with who's also engaged in the Power of Zero campaign from Microsoft called Jacqueline Boucher, and she, I think in particular, makes a very strong and forceful argument for uh, approaching this from the perspective of promoting digital civility. And I think from us, from our perspective at UNESCO, that's important because we're describing the behavior we want. We were describing the positive outcome that we want. We want digital civility online. And, and I think Describing things in that positive way, that's one of the things that we learned from public health, is that rather than attacking a problem and describing the awful, terrible problem, we, we get better results when we talk about the behavior or the desirable positive action that we're seeking. Um, so I think that's also quite, a, quite a, an important and powerful outcome. Um, we've now had three excellent presentations from Mirid, Robert, and Kieran, um, looking at the issue of cyberbullying from different perspectives with the great kind of definitional um, uh, perspective that Mairead shared, as well as some of the, the, the data, particularly from um, Ireland. We've had the, 
the international perspective on interventions with a focus on um, whole school approaches from Robert, which I think was very stimulating, and then Kieran's presentation just now. So we have an opportunity for some questions from the audience. If you'd like to raise your hand, I'm told we have volunteers or colleagues in the audience that can come to you with a microphone to take those questions. So I see a hand over here. Please briefly say who you are and, and get straight to your question. My name is Pat Chai and I'm from Vermont in the United States. Um, I was interested in terms of the whole school approach, which I um, am really supportive of, and I was delighted that you had addressed the need for school climate and how staff deal with staff. I've worked uh, in a variety of school systems, uh, both within and school systems for 30 years, and I've always identified uh, that the way that we need to really approach these problems is with the staff of the school. There's always this expectation that we focus on the kids' behaviors, where I find the staff are, can be quite unkind to each other um, and, and really create a very negative attitude. And so I'm wondering how much in your work do you really focus on, in any of you there, in terms of really looking at how staff treat each other, how teachers treat each other, how administrators teach staff? Because that's really what trickles down to, I think, often creating a school climate in which kids bully each other. Thank you. Great, thank you for that question. I think we'll take a couple of questions and then we'll, we'll open it up to the panel for a response. Nicholas. Hi, um, I'm Nicholas Carla, and, and I'm helping to coordinate the Para Zero campaign. Thank you for, for mentioning that. So I'm here because I'm hungry for solutions, and I got very excited when Kieran started talking about a noticeable shift in behaviors online, especially unwanted contact on, online. So my question is, um, this can be answered by any of you, but it's around what are you seeing that's shifting online for the for the positive and what do you think is driving that because i'm very curious if we can get at what's driving it we can start to replicate that across the world so what's what's making things better and why thanks very much for that question um okay i see two other hands there and there thank you my name is hezron i'm from tanzania uh, thank you so your uh, presentations and uh, I've heard about the whole school approach and various approaches which can be used to prevent uh, bullying. My question is, we know that uh, across the globe, different countries have had different pace in getting into the digital world. There are some who are ahead, some are just leapfrogging, getting into it. They didn't go through the pathway, smooth pathway on how to get into the technology. Can one approach apply across the world? Or we have unique approaches according to the context? Thank you. Great, wonderful to have a question from an African colleague. And let's have one more question, then we'll, we'll Hi, it I'm up. Monica, I'm from India. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been working with school children and uh, in an anti-bullying program. So I, I just wanted to know, maybe in brief, like how could you differentiate a school, a whole school approach for traditional bullying and cyber bullying? Because I've been working with kids and I feel that, you know, um, one approach is not working and it's not really helping with cyber bullying. I did not feel any change in that. So maybe, I know it's a very broad topic, but if you could just briefly tell how could we differentiate a whole school approach in both of these, especially with parents, because it's, I just wanted a brief approach on that. Thank you. Great, thank you. So we'll, we'll, we'll now turn to the panel. One thing I want to mention is that we do have two other presentations. We just didn't want to have five presentations before you could start to jump in with questions because it's sometimes hard to remember from the, the first set of speakers. But we do have um, two very good presentations left that I think will get at some of the questions that I'm hearing. Um, so so it's a, just bear that in mind. But um, let's, let's open it up to the whole panel in terms of um, what we've heard. Um, particularly, I heard a couple of questions around the whole school approach and the colleague from Vermont mentioning um, the importance of how staff treat each other in particular. I think maybe that's a question for Robert, and maybe you can combine that as well with the question about the whole school approach and the offline and, um, versus cyberbullying approach. So maybe you could start, Robert. Sure. Um, I'll start by answering the last, last thing. I don't, I don't really differentiate between the two. Um, I think I mentioned that many successful anti-bullying programs actually include cyberbullying within the context 
of other forms of bullying. So it's more approach of trying to gather everyone around the kid and try to work towards the same direction, which is the cyberbullying direction as well. Now, I'm not saying that it's just the school's responsibility. I think that the school has a, um, it's easier for them logistically to try to gather people around a student. So may it be ordinary, traditionally bullying, as called, or cyberbullying. Um, I think it's quite similar. Did that, did that answer the question, or yeah. if it's differentiated somehow within? Yeah. Okay, yeah, the literature, there is really scarce literature on anti-bullying programs in school that deal with cyberbullying. Because uh, uh, in the beginning, the research was focusing more on what it was, the negative consequences. So it's just now we're starting to get some figures in of what actually works. And it does seem that this whole school approach works as well within the cyberbullying context as well. Uh, the second question to the staff and staff, we are just now rolling out a program here, a national program for all post-primary schools in Ireland, where we are looking at some of these things as well. Uh, we're getting some preliminary data on, on how that affects, on how staff and staff treat each other. But in the past literature, it has shown that it's the whole school climate. And very importantly, I mean, our kids are modeling behavior on us adults. So it is important how staff and staff treat each other as well. Um, not sure if that answered the whole question for you. That's great, thank you. Um, Kieran, we heard um, the colleague from Tanzania talk or bring up the issue of different um, levels of access to um, the internet and, and online. Um, I wonder if you, I think your data, obviously coming from 22 different countries, we're looking at the averages and the data that you presented, but I think obviously there's a wide variation between those countries. I wonder if you could respond to that. Yeah, sorry, I, I, thanks for the question. Um, Looking at that table where I had the Ireland at, at number 11, um, if the, the, the main driver was actually the United States had the largest drop in terms of the DCI, the Digital Civility Index. It went from 61 to 51. Uh, the UK is also at 50, that's the lowest. Uh, France, Germany and Belgium were then the next lowest at 52, 56 and 57 and they also had the largest drops. So a small enough group of countries, I think, drove uh, that 4% that, uh, uh, that drop overall in the act or being uh, approached with unwanted content or unwanted approaches. Um, it was across the board, but there was a number of countries driving it. Um, in terms of what, what is, you know, what's the cause of that, the DCI doesn't capture that explicitly, but one could, I suppose, suggest correlation rather than necessarily causation with, with awareness programs, Safer Internet Day, this type of activity, the type of engagement at schools. The fact that this agenda, I think, is just in a public policy context, is being mainstreamed. It's not a thing at the end of a, a to-do list. It's right up towards the top of the to-do list because it's seen as a holistically uh, beneficial uh, societal gain, but uh, I would say that's just the, as I said, I would suggest correlation at, at least uh, without going as far as causation. Sure, but I, I think um, that, if I understood correctly, the question from Nicholas was really just trying to understand the reasons behind um, these trends, and if we understand why we're seeing an improvement in digital civility, what, what are the reasons for that? Well, I, I think because of the types of programs that, that I just described, that it, 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 these programs are being mainstream, people are much more aware of it, mm -hmm. the types of things Microsoft are doing with all those kids. We have a program where we train uh, Irish teachers uh, with, uh, uh, for tech skills to be able to teach in the classroom. We have, in five years, we did 30,000 teachers. Again, they would be exposed to that sort of agenda as well. So I think it is those types of programs that are incrementally making a difference. I know the government here are, are in the middle of an online consultation, or a consultation process about online uh, harm. So the government are, and I know, I happen to work with Richard Bruton, so I know how seriously he will take that agenda, and it won't just be 
as I said, an item on a to-do list. It'll be a, a, a core issue, okay. I think. So awareness of the importance of cyberbullying and also, I guess, having data that tells us that there is a change and a positive change in some instances. And then, of course, evaluation of these individual programs. To, none of us, we don't want to be using scarce resources to support interventions that aren't effective, obviously. So uh, the importance of... Um, evaluations to make sure that when we are investing in, in interventions that they're the most effective ones. In the university context, it would be safe to say more research is probably required. Uh, yes. <laughs> but it's already great to have the trend data from the 22 countries that you've shared with us, Kieran, that's great. And then just, the, I, I want to pick up again on the colleague from Tanzania's point about different levels of digital access because um, one of the things that we've seen from UNESCO is that in, in, um, in Sub-Saharan Africa in particular, um, people don't imagine the level of access that has really exploded. Um, young people in Africa find a way to get online, whether it's through their mobile phone or one way or another they manage to do it. And I think it's really important that we not forget developing countries as part of this overall approach. Um, I wonder if you have anything to say about that from a perspective of Microsoft. Sorry, obviously Microsoft have a broad agenda that the, the the, the more people that can participate. In the, and again, we have to always remember that the positives uh, with being available to get online in a European context, it's being able to access the digital single market or to solve some public policy agenda items for remote geographies and with online health or training or teaching. So there are all those positives. Um, I, I just have a personal reminiscence, um, actually, from my time working in government in India. Um, on, a, on a trade mission, and just to speak to the point about the capacity to get on, online, the government in India had a program that they were trying, a social welfare program that they were trying to orchestrate to deliver, um, uh, I think it was a food distribution program. And because of the numbers of people uh, living in temporary accommodation, shanty towns, or whatever else, the only way they could, and this was 2012 or 2013, the only way they could manage a, a national program with unique identifiers was through mobile phones. And literally every kid, every person in every town seemed to have access to a mobile phone. So it is the potential route to solutions, public policy solutions, but you've got to tackle the, the, the challenges the risks that come with that. Well. Yep. Thank you very much for that. Mairead, any observations from your perspective on the questions that you heard? No, they were great questions. Um, I think maybe there was a question about positive strategies and what works. And I think, I mean, like we've you've mentioned, there's many online safety programs um, which are will do a certain level of the prevention work for for keep, pe keeping people safe online. But I think also it's important that we consider it in the context of movements that are happening already. So, for example, if we look at sexual content, the Me Too movement will look at things around consent and actually just the issue of consent and asking kids, do you have consent before you share that image, before you take that image? So again, it's this, you know, the social stuff that's happening off offline can also be really beneficial for simple strategies that we'll use in the online world as well, which is a, is a language that more young people have today about their rights, their responsibilities, about equality and diversity. And I think the more that we talk about those things offline and we encourage our children and our students to be kind of responsible, civic responsibility to make sure that inclusion is happening everywhere they see it, that will also filter, I think, online as well. So coming from the online safety top down to the bottom up standard, you know, good practices that, it, that are good for, for society more generally as well, that we need to be doing all of those things. Yep, I'm really glad to hear you mention the, the importance of inclusion as well, because one of the things that struck me is, uh, well, one of my own kind of learning moments was just how devastating it can be for, for young people when they feel excluded. And that's not necessarily perceived very obviously as, a, as, a, as, a, as an attack or a, a cyberbullying issue, but actually that exclusion can be incredibly powerful and devastating for a young person as well. So I'm, yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that. In the interest of time, we're going to push on for uh, two more uh, presentations that I'm really excited about. Um, the first being from Janice Richardson, um, probably known to many of you. She's, uh, she's got such a, uh, an extensive background that I don't even know where to begin, but I would just say that she is on the Facebook Safety Advisory Board. She's an author of more than a dozen books. She has done work extensively with the European Union and the Council of Europe. 
um, all to promote the well-being of children and young people and protecting their rights online. So Janice, over to you for your presentation, please. Thank you, and it's a great pleasure to be here with you. Good afternoon. I'm going to deep dive into something very concrete. It's a whole school approach. It's something that we rolled out for two years with funding from DG Justice of the European Commission, but then it grew. You'll see in the dark red the countries that were involved, and I think that the the great thing about this project was that each country had its speciality. We had the Adolescent Health Unit from Greece for the research. Uh, Belgium, with our contact with policy, we were able to get Facebook, Vodafone, uh, Twitter, and Kaspersky on board, so industry was involved. And also, we had a research board which had uh, half a dozen of the really top researchers in the world in our board from Australia and the USA. The project grew, I think, because of the content that we built, and there are examples over there that you can pick up on your way out. I also went to the Seychelles to help them train all of the levels of staff, of school, parents, and policymakers, and they have now introduced the Enable project. But let's look at a few facts about bullying that we began with when we began the Enable project. We know that more than 60% of bullying actually begins in a face-to-face -face situation, but it can be taken online afterwards. Cyberbullying, the big problems are helping kids deal with social media, mess messaging apps, and the gaming platforms where many young boys are bullied. Anti-bullying campaigns can actually promote bullying if you don't take into account the whole school approach. A majority of children believe that if they tell an adult, things are just going to get worse, and I think that explains some of the figures that we've seen. And almost three out of 14 say that they've been mean online, but less than 20% say they've been victims of bullying. And I think that here also definitions are important. Very often, what is peer victimization, uh, we consider bullying. Bullying has to be repetitive with an imbalance of power. So, we did pre-testing. Uh, the idea was to pre-test and to post-test, and we found some very surprising things. We found that one in three pupils, 11 to 14-year-olds, say that they have self-control difficulties. The number was amazingly different. 40% of young people in, the U in Greece, but 57% in the UK, said that they had a great difficulty in differentiating between different types of emotions. They were hurt, they would get angry, they would mistake aggression for other things. 10% reported they had no... ...of others. One in four had no affinity whatsoever for helping other people who were upset. And once again, the figures varied largely. In Croatia, 25% of young people were unaware that their influence, that their emotions influence reactions. On the other hand, 40% of young people in the UK this led us to understand, or at least to give us a model to work on. Self-awareness is important. Self-management, social awareness, and relationship management. And this is the basis of what we did. Whole school approach, we've already talked about it. At the heart, young people with all their individual characteristics. And it's meant to be the role of the school 
to promote the uniqueness of every child and provide a very safe environment where a child can learn comfortably. Of those of you who have looked at Owius, uh, uh, his um, long-term analysis of the impact of bullying, see that the bully and those who have been victimized will suffer later in life in terms of criminal record, in terms of social and health well-being. Next, of course, we have the teachers, the school, everything around the pupil. Next, the microsystem with the families uh, and the teachers. And finally, the economic conditions because we discovered that the five in the five countries involved in the Enable project, the, the climate, the social climate, the also economic climate, climate made a big difference. How did we deal with each of these levels? We had social, emotional learning activities for young people, but also a peer training program. The peer training program was led by a teacher in the school, was supported with a meeting with the peer uh, educators, we can call them, once a week, and the, the teachers got their own training. Ambassador training, two teachers from the same school, and their responsibility was to roll out the program in seven neighboring schools. School leadership, we've mentioned it, and there is fairly comprehensive training that we conducted and that is written up in the documentation over there. And finally, we had to adapt the project. Greece was going through very big economic problems. We had to adapt the program to ensure that we matched the climate. What did we find? Social emotional learning, no secret, improves self-control, but it also improves problem solving and the ability to identify between emotions. It helps build interpersonal skills, self-confidence, and awareness of bullying. And here I must say, I work with young people from nine countries, and when I asked them what do we do about bullying, they said, but we should learn about self-esteem at school. We should learn about online, offline life balance. Why aren't the teachers teaching us what we need? The combination of socio-emotional socio learning and peer support creates a very different climate in the classroom. Higher motivation, less absenteeism. And teachers reported that when once they understand bullying much better, they're able to deal with it better. I think there are seven keys that we should maintain. First, if we really want to help kids within the school, provide a, predictor, a predictable, ordered social environment. Include a motivational, emotional component so that they see difficulties as challenge. Actively engage children in problem solving, which is one reason I think that now we are seeing improvement in some areas. Foster a sense of self-efficacy promote physical activity, and lastly, encourage curiosity and exploration to maintain and to manage uncertainty. And our program was actually built about the Fostering Change program of UNESCO. There, I think we can't do anything if we don't involve all of these areas, policies, teacher training, pedagogy, curriculum, assessment, the technology that's available in the school and the learning that goes on around it, and school organization. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Janice. I, I know you could, we could have a whole session just with Janice sharing the wonderful experiences from those countries that um, the Enable program has worked. What, just before going on to Anita's presentation, though, I have to ask, because I'm guessing others wondered as well, why the promotion of physical activity? The other things seemed really obvious, but could you maybe just say a word or two about the promotion of physical activity as one of the key 
Uh, sorry, why so social emotional activity? Yeah. Uh, I well, it was physical activity, actually. Oh, yeah. physical activity. Yeah. Physical activity is actually very important. One, for kids who really aren't that great in school, often they can show their capacity. Another thing is that it, it creates a different sort of interpersonal relationship. And if the teacher's very observant, they can pick up a number of things from physical activity that they're not going to pick up when a kid's sitting in the classroom, hardly moving around at all. I think also we need to get a bit of oxygen in our brain. So, and in Australia, and I am Australian, uh, we have some physical activity every day, a half hour session of physical activity and a whole morning of, uh, afternoon of sport. So it, it, it seems, and the research shows this, it's a very important element in fostering uh, resilience. Great, thank you very much. Um, our final presentation today, and we're quite excited that she's come all the way from Singapore to share with us uh, Anita Lo Lim from Touch Community Services. She's gonna share with us a little bit more about what you've heard already, a few people reference, including myself, which is the Power of Zero campaign, and specifically how that's being implemented in Anita's country, Singapore. Good afternoon. My name is Anita, and I come from Singapore. My organization is Touch Community Services, Established in 1986, we are a social service agency in Singapore, working with children, youths, families, the elderly, and people with special needs. Our vision is to build strong families, caring generations, and enabled community. In 2001, we started a youth service called Touch Cyber Wellness to help individuals and parents and families grow in the digital age. Today, Touch Cyber Wellness is Singapore's award-winning and leading pioneer non-profit agency advocating for cyber wellness values and media literacy among children, youths, parents, educators, and counsellors. Over the last 18 years, we have worked with about 1.8 million individuals, and our cyber wellness counselling programmes are validated and we have created education, intervention, and advocacy programs for the community. The work of Touch Cyber Wellness is built on three pillars, education, intervention, advocacy, with a foundation of research and development, together with our research partners in the universities. The pillar of education is especially instrumental in bringing the cyber wellness messages into the schools where the children and the youths are. We have an ecosystem, just to group the people that we're working with. We have worked with the individuals, we have worked with the family units, we have worked with the schools, and we have worked in the community. There are a series of maybe 20 to 30 programs that we provide to all these people in Singapore. Power of Zero. The Power of Zero campaign is one of our advocacy messages in Singapore. The Power of Zero envisions a world of zero hate, zero violence, and zero bullying. Touch Cyber Wellness is very privileged to be able to roll this out in Singapore, and thanks to Nicholas and uh, UNESCO for the support. This campaign has gathered great response from the community. We prepared a video to show you how we launched this program in Singapore. This is an advocacy message in the community, and we took it all the way to the public train. The train is the most popular mode of transportation for Singaporeans. So sit back and relax. Touch Cyber Wellness is an award-winning and leading pioneer in the field of cyber wellness education, partnering Power of Zero on a global cyberbullying awareness campaign in Singapore in 2018. As part of the campaign, Touch Cyber Wellness launched a cyber wellness theme train on one of Singapore's train lines, spreading the message of kindness to some 245,000 commuters daily for a month. The train featured handles on good online etiquette and practices, as well as quotes by individuals who were affected by cyberbullying. 
The train lunch was officiated by our guest of honor, Singapore Senior Parliamentary Secretary for the Ministry of Education and Ministry of Social and Family Development, Associate Professor Mohammad Faisal Ibrahim, and witnessed by community partners and a celebrity campaign ambassador. To teach the next generation to stand up to cyberbullying, Touch Cyber Wellness has developed a peer support leadership program. In addition, with materials from Power of Zero, Touch Cyber Wellness has been educating children and families on cyberbullying at parent-child workshops. Touch Cyber Wellness is committed to empowering our children and youth to live well and be kind in this digital age. Now, tell me, is it a kind word or is it not kind? So the impact, I don't know, the impact of cyberbullying is Together, we can shape the future of our community. The campaign was officially launched on 6 February 2018, and we received support from um, government officials, the minister, the member of parliament, and also celebrities who came forward because they recognized and they could understand the effect of cyberbullying on individuals. And the main media carried the launch event in both the English and Chinese newspaper, and as a result of this, it brought the Power of Zero campaign to more people and it stirred a conversation on cyberbullying in Singapore. And these are pictures of the train. The train ran for three months, and it reached out to about eight million uh, eyeballs, and we received calls from public about cyberbullying uh, matters, receiving help, parents who call in wanting to send their children for counselling. Uh, it has that kind of effect when we roll out a community advocacy message. And so with the campaign in the, at the community level, we complemented it with the school programme. We developed programmes for student ambassadors in Singapore schools, and in the pilot program of 10 schools, we work with 80 student ambassadors in both primary and secondary schools on developing cyber wellness, uh, cyber bullying strategies, managing strategies, coping strategies, and building a culture of kindness in the school. This, you see, are designed by the student ambassadors after the project. These are advocacy collaterals that they develop after the lesson, helping us, informing us that the lesson has a way of connecting with them, and this is how they're expressing themselves. We developed folders out of some of these designs, and we distributed it to the students so that they can keep it for a piece of reminder. We incorporated the power of zero into our preschool cyber wellness education. We first brought power of zero into the secondary school where the youths are because that was where the problem was the most serious. And then we went upstream to the primary schools where the children are, and then we moved further upstream to the preschool because we wanted to teach, together with power of zero, values-based cyber wellness education. And in this particular curriculum, we embedded the value of kindness, as you saw in the video, for the preschool children. Touch Cyber Wellness has developed a preschool cyber wellness curriculum, and it consists of six books. There are four storybooks that we, that we produce, we develop, we produce ourselves, and these are in the form of big books, and the book is, is so big. And there are four stories, and you have one activity book, and you have one parent's guide. The whole idea is parents can take this set home and work on the activities with their children to reinforce the learning outcome at home, outside of the school hours. You see the inside of the big book. It has got vivid illustration and interactive elements that the children can actually pull. And it is designed to engage and to captivate their attention as we tell the story in class. These are worksheets that we develop that they use after the lessons in class. And they are simple enough 
age appropriate based on our Ministry of Education's curriculum for, for preschool, and we consulted preschool educators in the design of these worksheets. Now, that is the, 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 some of the materials that we developed. This is the classroom. This is a classroom uh, program. The coach from us sits in front and gives the story to a class of students, and we invite parents to sit in these sessions to learn about what their children are learning. And we find that with parental involvement for this very young age, it helps to reinforce the learning outcome. They are very young children, but we hope that the values that they learn at a young age will somehow guide their behavior online as they begin their exposure to screen time at a very, very age, a young age. Crush Explorer, the preschool cyber wellness education material in Singapore, has reached about 51 preschools, and we have worked with about 2,547 children. The response from the children has been overwhelming, and we realize that as we engage the children at this very young age, we cannot work without the family. And together, we are really hoping that it will help the parents and the caregivers to build a strong families, because at this age, parental involvement is at the highest of a child's life. With the Power of Zero campaign rolled out in Singapore, it has helped us to shape and create conversation about how we should manage cyberbullying issues in the schools and in the communities and in the family. We see the effect of cyberbullying spilling over into our intervention programs where more and more counselling cases are coming in because the child has experienced traumatic uh, experiences online because of cyberbullying. So we are thankful for the opportunity to be able to introduce this to Singapore, and we are going to roll out the phase two of Power of Zero campaign in Singapore in the coming months. And um, if you're keen to find out more, write to us, and we can, be in contact, uh, we can be in contact, and we are happy to share with you what we are about to do <laughs> in the upcoming months in the phase two of Power Zero campaign in Singapore. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anita. It was great to have that presentation and see um, an actual intervention, how it works. And for people who are interested, you can also go to the Power of Zero website and download for free the materials and the information about the campaign. More of the learning materials are being developed and will be posted online when they're available. So um, do feel free to go and have a look. Talk to Nicholas or Anita or others who are involved in the campaign, Microsoft, Janice, myself, and others are on the steering committee. Um, we have time for one or two questions from the audience. I would say it's been a, it's been a terrific panel, so I'm already going to kind of pre-thank you for the wonderful presentations. And I think consistent um, throughout was the emphasis on the whole school approach, including the involvement of the community and the parents that Anita's just underscored so powerfully. But let's, let's see if we can fit in one or two questions. And then I would just say that I'm sure all the panelists will be here throughout the day, and, and um, some might be here for the next couple of days if you want to try and have further conversations with them after this particular session. So do we have one or two questions from the audience? Um, okay, I see one hand here. Hi, thank you for your wonderful presentations. My name is Marika, I'm from the Netherlands. And um, to me, it makes super sense that we focus on the school and especially the whole school also regarding cyberbullying. Um, but I sometimes ask on online forums like Reddit, for example, which has a huge audience, more than a billion people, whether people think that this is the school's responsibility or whether this is the teacher's responsibility and the overwhelming response I get from those fora is no, that's the parent's responsibility and even teachers say this. So, but that's not science, of course, that's just me asking things. So I wonder if you have any insight in whether schools actually feel that this is their responsibility, whether teachers feel that and what the general public thinks. Great, thank you very much for that important question. And do we have one more question from the audience um, before we ask our panelists to wrap up? Yes. 
Thank you. Uh, wonderful presentations. Pat Connolly, I'm in Galway. I'm with Lions Club International. And what Lions Club do are able to uh, support projects to be delivered to the community. As a grandparent, uh, I have a couple of observations to make, and I would agree with the last uh, speaker that I think there's a, a, a great need to do some more research in connection with updating parents in connection with what helps to build uh, the confidence with the, themselves initially to be able to handle, with, handle the issue. Um, there's a tendency to dump things in school and it's the teacher's responsibility. So I would just think that there's an opportunity to do further work. And I think there's Dr. Rob that mentioned it as well. Earlier on in the presentation, there was a reference to a project that was in one of the schools that was very effective and then there was left a small percentage of kids and they identified that 37% of the parents weren't supporting the kids in that situation. It's so that I think there's some need for work there. Thank you. Okay, so let's um, turn over to our panel. Any reactions to the questions that we've just heard? It seems to focus a lot on role of the schools, role of the parents. Is it, is it one or the other, or both? Any, any, anybody want to jump in with a response? Janice. Uh, well, it's definitely the school, it's definitely both. If you look at the United Nations Convention of the Rights of the Child, the child has the right to be protected no matter where he is, has the right to have a safe environment for learning, so it's everyone's role. I think secondly, I've been doing a little study of primary school curricula over the last couple of weeks, and I see that almost everyone says, all countries say that they're out to develop the uniqueness of the child, to give the child an environment where all of his potential uh, can be exploited. So I think for those two reasons, firstly, but secondly, uh, the school is part of the community. And we all believed about 15 years ago that the internet was going to break down that, that barrier. It hasn't fully succeeded, but children turn to teachers to learn how to use technology correctly. And uh, so I think it's up to teachers to set the example and to deal with these issues. Cyberbullying is exactly like bullying. It affects the way the child will develop. Great, thank you. Any other comments from our panelists? Myriad, Robert? Um, I'll just say really briefly, I totally agree. And, and we have um, some, a study that we've just finished with some pre-service or trainee teachers in Ireland in the biggest training college that we have. And we are finding, we're asking them when they, like using vignettes and saying a, a student in your class has done this, this or this. Um, we've asked them things about attribution of blame, so how much they blame the student for getting into you know, complicated situations. Uh, the, most of the vignettes had negative outcomes after they had done something online. And we're also asking them how responsible they feel um, for dealing with that or helping the student. And actually, the, the results were quite positive. These, and these are teachers that are being trained at the moment, and they're, for the most part, feeling responsible. Um, it probably depends on the actual scenario that they read about. So if a child has decided to just share images for attention, they don't feel as responsible to actually try and solve that or help them. But if they've been approached by a stranger or you know, somebody, a friend of theirs has done something negative, they feel a lot more. So it's not that simple to say that they're going to definitely intervene with cyberbullying, but I think more and more teachers are feeling responsible for it. And I think that's because of interventions and awareness and the recognized, you know, people, principals are recognizing that they have a duty of care for their children, no matter if it's offline or online. It's their responsibility to make sure that they're safe. Great, thank you. Robert, did you? Yeah, just quickly, I, I agree as well. I think we all have a responsibility, but I think the school are the professional who might be able to distance themselves emotionally. A parent might not be able to handle the situation properly because they're emotionally involved. So therefore, I think it's important for the school um, to be on the forefront with help, obviously, from organizations, from the research community. Uh, but they're the professionals. I think they are more likely to handle the situations more properly. Good. Anita, any, any reactions from you? Um, in, in Singapore, I think what we try to do is to have a multi-entry point approach. So wherever you go to, whether it's to the school or to the community agency or to a friend, um, there are some touch points where you can get help from, 
and we, are, we, feel all, we all feel responsible for, for, for the child or for the person who is uh, cyberbullied. Um, so we don't have a clear uh, separation of whose responsibility it is, but in Singapore, we are definitely setting up a system where you can get help at different points, wherever you are. Great, thank you. Karen, any final comment from you? Sorry, I, I would agree violently with the, the comments made, but maybe using not with a Microsoft hat on, but with sort of previous public policy hat on, there's always a danger that it's structurally and logically correct to say that it is the teacher, the school, um, but from a public policy point of view, there's always a danger that that just allows that an abdication of responsibility for parents and o other stakeholders. It's, it's always easy just to go, there, that's yours. <laughs> um, now we're done, you know? Um, so, so I think we just, that's the only caveat I would offer to that from a public policy point of view. Sure. So essentially, we all have a role to play. I want to thank you, the audience, for staying through 90 minutes of what I thought was an excellent set round of presentations, interactions, and questions. And let's have a round of applause, finally, for our panelists. <laughs>